The last paper in this session is given by Dr. Jim Olivier of Microbiotics in Georgia and States. I'll read Jim to introduce his paper. The uh, commonly used practical methods, as we said, were developed some time ago, and visualize the decomposition of the experimental isotherm in an imaginary way, starting usually at the highest uh, experimental pressure, uh, up at this corner. To visualize the desorption or decrement of the adsorption branch, if you like, by a certain small amount, perhaps the amount of the experimental interval. That quantity of adsorptive is then assigned uh, in an accounting fashion uh, to uh, pores which would empty in that pressure interval. Now, some, some uh, debate and discussion goes on about how to assign a size to that pressure interval, but we'll, we'll skip that for now. And so for the very first pore increment, one uh, assigns the decrement of absorption to the emptying of pores in a certain size range. We then go to the next decrement of absorptive and assign that to Desorption from the previously emptied pores according to some pre established and agreed upon thickness curve, or uh, basically a reference isotherm, and the amount that is observed in excess of that quantity is assigned to the desorption or evaporation from the next pore size increment. And we proceed this way uh, strictly in an accounting fashion. Uh, accounting for exactly 100% of everything that's done with each step and work out <coughs> the isotherm, uh, calculating a poor volume distribution. Uh, <coughs> refinements, of course, include uh, allowing for the thickness of the adsorbed film that exists uh, at each pressure interval, or in some cases, you know, further correcting for the curvature of the pore uh, and the thickness that might exist that pressure interval. The one thing these methods seem to have in common, however, is that there's a big assumption at the start, and that is that all the pores in the solid are filled. That is, you have achieved complete saturation of the pore network. <clears throat> in the case of the example isotherm I've shown here on top, this is pretty clearly the case. We have a nice uh, at H3, I can never remember, uh, plateau and it's showing that uh, all the core network is, is filled uh, <coughs> so we can safely make such an assumption. In the lower curve, 
first. We see that we're not quite so sure we can make that assumption at our highest experimental pressure. And indeed, depending on the experiment, we may or may not uh, have achieved pore filling or the same fraction of pore filling in different experimental runs. So this is something of a problem with uh, what we can call the BPH method, just as a typical example of this, of this process. So how else might we, might we approach this? Well, as I said, these, these methods are accounting type methods. They, they exactly uh, take care of everything that happens, with the consequence that if the thickness curve you're using for reference in doing this is inappropriate, let's say uh, it, it uh, predicts uh, more material desorbed in a given step than, than actually happens for this solid, then you will, uh, that fact will uh, cause you to assign that excess to pores that may not exist in that quantity. And even in the worst case, as you finally work your way down the isotherm, uh, you have such an excess that you have to assign it to small pores that maybe don't even exist at all. The converse situation, of course, can arise in that you don't observe as much desorption in the decrement as would be predicted by the pore size distribution that's currently generated, and you just have to stop because otherwise you're faced with creating negative pore volume. So both of these are a little unsatisfactory outcomes. The uh, previous speaker uh, showed what you can do. Uh, so instead of Michael's nice colorful first slide, I'll show the, the equation. Basically, we can express the problem <coughs> this way. Well, isothermal absorption. Uh, there are a lot of assumptions in using this equation, of course, that uh, the pores are not interconnected and, and so on. But <clears throat> taking it at its face value, uh, we simply say that the observed isotherm, Q of P, is the integral over all pore sizes of some kernel function, which describes adsorption in a given size pore, with a pore size distribution uh, that we would like to know. Since really we're only interested in the numerics of this, uh, we usually approach this problem in a discretized form uh, as a summation rather than try to find a functional fit for the uh, elements. Since I don't have any great theory to talk about, we're only talking about the Kelvin equation after all, uh, we might look at the uh, black box of deconvolution here for a moment see what's inside, and it's really not that bad. The problem is to find the vector f that minimizes uh, this expression, where q is the experimental vector representing the adsorption isotherm, and little q is the kernel function. Uh, f is the unknown solution vector of pore, size, pore sizes, uh, pore areas, I should say, that you want to find. And the object is to find a vector f that provides a good fit to the data, subject to the condition that f is always greater than zero. We don't want any negative pore areas. So we're confining it to physical solutions. Uh, as, as Nigel mentioned, uh, the, the uh, deconvolution and inversion of, of the integral of absorption is, has had some problems. So it's quite customary to add an additional constraint and that is to require that the solution be smooth. Uh, we want uh, to minimize the uh, second derivative, basically. So we will apply the additional constraint uh, of a smooth second derivative, or minimum second derivative. And just so you can do this, it's not that hard to code up. If we now define a, a new kernel function vector, Q prime, by augmenting Q with the term lambda d, and extend the uh, Q vector to Q prime with, with zeros, we can get the uh, 
expression that we really want to solve for him. So here now we have, we want the minimum value that will satisfy uh, simultaneously the requirement that the error be small, that we get a good fit to the data, and that we minimize to, such, to some extent the second derivative of the solution. And uh, for convenience, we can define the constant lambda in this way, uh, which means then that if lambda is 1, we're giving about equal weight to the second derivative as to the residual error. Uh, normally, for uh, the results I'm going to show you, uh, lambda can be very small indeed, usually about 0, 0, 001. So very little regularization is needed uh, in, in these cases. OK, what, what do we really expect from, from this exercise? After all, we've got the same theoretical model. Uh, what more can we learn from it? The one big thing that it turns out that we, we gain in doing this is what was lacking in the BJH technique, is that we don't have to assume anymore that all cores are full. Because one of the models or kernel functions that can be included is that for the free surface. Basically, the empty pores to experiment they didn't fill. <clears throat> if that works out, then you would expect that when you do the deconvolution on uh, isotherms containing different data sets, that you would get consistent results for the poor area. And that's what I want to show with four examples now that we do get. Uh, there's a fair amount of data on this slide. Uh, first of all, the, the isotherm, just to give you a feel for what it looks like. Over here, we have the resulting pore size distribution obtained by the deconvolution of a set of pore sizes with the experimental data. Uh, don't worry about the, the weight of this here. This is uh, spurious and caused by the interpolation of the team between experimental points. Uh, it's a signature of the team's flying. But if you had more experimental points, then it would be less than this. It's quite clear from the volume distribution here that we haven't filled all the pores at the highest experimental pressure. Uh, this would seem certainly to be a truncated distribution stopping at uh, 2,000 angstroms. <coughs> the output of the deconvolution is here. Uh, first of all, the filled pore area. Uh, this is basically the function f, which is the area of pores of different sizes. <clears throat> and these have been calculated by using progressive amounts of the data. That is, uh, by 0.2 maximum relative pressure means that all the data here was obtained with just the adsorption isotherm below 0.2 relative pressure. Just the monolayer region, no pores are filled. Basically, what we're doing there is fitting a thickness curve to our isotherm, which is almost like an alpha S plot. We're scaling, scaling isotherms. Uh, we get very little pore volume, um, and we get a total surface area uh, based on that as a scaling factor. If we use more and more of the experimental isotherm, then we start to fill pore volume, which is the pink curve. We see that the filled pore area increases. The remaining area unfilled decreases, as you'd expect. And quite nicely, then, the blue circles are the total of filled and unfilled pore area from the deconvolution. The unfilled being the amount of free surface necessary to give it the best fit. You would expect these to add to a constant value. And I think quite satisfactorily they do. Uh, I was quite surprised how well they do. And for good measure, if you plot the BET surface area as, as a straight line, it falls right in there. Uh, <clears throat> that's not a discovery. After all, the T curve was generated by scaling an adsorption isotherm using the BET surface area. So we haven't learned anything new about BET. Uh, what we have <coughs> seemingly learned, though, is that. Uh, this model is sufficient to fit the data whether the pores are filled, and hence their volume and surface are related by the geometry of the cylinder, or whether they're totally unfilled and their surface is simply a matter of scale and the thickness curve. And I thought that was, uh, that was surprisingly good. 
Uh, it means that the 4V over R uh, surface to volume ratio for cylinders is being obeyed rather nicely for this material. Then going on to another factor still, a finer one. <coughs> Again, same, same process using different amounts of the beta. Uh, we see on this isotherm that there's a good chance we can fill all the core volume. And indeed, the distribution is nicely complete looking. Uh, again, the filled uh, core area increases to maximum. The unfilled decreases to near zero in this case, as it should. And the sum of the two is very nearly constant and equal to the DDT surface area. Next uh, material is a piece of gel. Again, an isoporous solid, uh, slightly still smaller uh, pore size distribution, uh, very clear uh, filling of the total pore volume. Uh, again, very similar looking sorts of curves. You start to fill pore volume fairly early. Uh, fill the unfilled pore area, and again, the sum being very nearly constant and uh, nicely coincident with the BEG surface area. This gets, to me, is even more surprising. Uh, about a little over 0.8, of course, is, is where uh, a lot of pore filling is taking place. So we're very rapidly fitting models that represent filled cylindrical pores. Uh, we're, we're starting to use those models from our matrix and dispensing with the free surface model, which is simply has to be scaled. And bear in mind that the filled pores have a surface to volume ratio that's fixed by the geometry. It's not a free variable. So to me, it's quite remarkable that in such a case, even at this transition, uh, there's such a slight change in apparent or, or reduced surface area. You can begin to see a slight uh, change in level as you go from mostly filled to mostly empty pore space in terms of the apparent area. And then the last example uh, is uh, perhaps the severest <laughs> test. Uh, uh, you, you recognize, I'm sure, uh, uh, MCM 41, around 30 ounces of pore size, where we have very nice abrupt pore filling. Uh, so we, go, we switch very uh, abruptly below about 0.4 of pressure from simply scaling the thickness curve <coughs> to fitting uh, filled pores, filled cylindrical pores. And in this case, we can detect that there is a systematic difference between scaling the thickness curve and uh, accounting for the volume absorbed in right circular cylinders with smooth walls. Uh, <coughs> interesting to know what one could do with that difference, if anything. Uh, the thickness curve I've used here, by the way, is that book off of the board, since it provided the widest range, uh, particularly at high relative pressures, uh, that, that seemed to be reasonable. And, uh, uh, it was quite clear from looking at it, however, functionally, that, that it is not an appropriate thickness curve for an MCM-41. So what I suspect is that this, this end of the area calculation is, is low, and that if one actually were to use a better fitting thickness curve for this material, it would uh, be a lot more constant. But in any case, uh, this, this seems quite satisfactory uh, result, and I think uh, indicates some, some additional usefulness in life in the, in the Kelvin approach uh, when you're looking at these support materials. Thanks very much for your attention.
Thank you, Jim. The session's running a little late, but I think we've been forward since there are no parallel sessions. Uh, some time for discussion, both on this paper and on the papers generally. So can I invite uh, questions on this particular paper, maybe one or two, and then we can go on to talk about the papers in general. Okay, Professor Collins, one last question. Thank you very much, Jim. <laughs> okay, as in the uh, previous sessions, what we plan to do now is pass the microphone around to the five speakers. Uh, if I may, I'm going to go backwards in time. We've just heard from Jim again. So I don't need to remind you what he's speaking about. If I go backwards, before he was nice to see, he was talking about uh, uh, molecular simulations of point sizes and activities. And before him, there was Mike Myers talking about simulations of poor blocking phenomena. And then there was uh, David Nicholson with uh, simulations of diff diffusion in modern systems. And the first paper of the session was computer simulation. Uh, studies of uh, absorption in model selection reports with different possible functions and acting. And what I would plan to do is to invite discussion on all these papers together, but if you have any particular question for a particular order, if you say so, what I'll do now is simply hand the microphone down and invite questions from the audience. 